Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for being here today. It's great to see so much interest, not just in the university, but also in studying economics in particular. Um, this is definitely the funnest spot I've talked <laughs> to anyone about economics before. It feels like giving a TED talk. We just need the red spot somewhere here. Um, so thanks for being here. I'm Amrita Kulka. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Economics. And it's my pleasure to round out the session today by giving you just a short taste test of what an undergraduate lecture in economics at this university might look at, look like. Um, and then also by giving you my pitch for why I think it's worth uh, thinking about studying economics. So let me actually start with that. So the reason that I got into economics was because it seemed like the questions that relate to economics are sort of inescapable, whether you're just going about your day-to-day -day life, whether you are uh, reading the news, whether you are being a good citizen, always you kept running into questions that are related to economics, and we'll talk a little bit more about these questions, um, some of these questions in a second. So it felt to me like it was worth investigating a little bit more uh, what's going on with these questions. What I didn't know when I started um, to study economics is that the subject is going to give me a different way of thinking and a different um, methodological toolkit that's quite rigorous to not just be able to ask economic questions, but also to find my way towards answering them. Of course, under given assumptions, of course, related to the model that you choose to analyze them with, but it's not just about asking questions, it's actually about a systematic way of answering questions. And why is that important? It's important because I would argue that a lot of the questions that we study in economics are extremely relevant both for individual decision making, so the day-to-day -day decisions we make in our lives, but also for decisions we make as a society. And I've put up here just a few questions, and this is really just beginning to scratch the surface of questions that we ask and try to answer in economics. Um, and I really suggest that if you're interested in anything even tangentially related to what's up here right now, you should definitely consider studying economics. So a lot of these questions you would undoubtedly uh, associate with studying economics, right? Take, for example, can we stem the rising cost of living? This is a question about can we fight inflation? It's something macroeconomists study all the time, and you would definitely attribute this to economics. Um, similarly, with how do people respond to a wealth tax? That's a question about taxation. Public economists look at this. Again, very clearly econ. If you're more interested in environmental, then the question of can emissions markets reduce pollution? Also very clearly an economic question. But there are a lot of other questions up here, which I've picked specifically to reflect also some of the work that's done at this department, either by my colleagues or by myself, that maybe you wouldn't instantly think about um, as being part of economics. So I really want to make the point here that, yes, we have traditionally associated economics question, but econ is more than that as well. So for example, um, is working from home here to stay, or was this just a fluke that was introduced by the pandemic? Does happiness boost productivity? Why did people vote for Brexit? Um, how does globalization affect disease transmission? Um, why are you here right now? Should you be doing a university degree or should you be going straight into a job? These are all questions that economists ask. And the questions that I ask are often related to things like how can we keep housing affordable, which we'll hear a little bit more about later today. Um, and then can government intervention revitalize high streets. This is something I find really interesting, and this is something that if you've been following the news and related to the leveling up debate in this country, then these are extremely important questions. So if anything on this slide vaguely interests you, economics might be for you. So I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention that you're going to be quite comfortable if you study economics in your future life. So what I've put here is just a slide that shows you the average earnings five years from graduation for students of different fields. And this is for women. The ranking is the same for men. However, we know that there's a little bit of a gender wage gap, unfortunately. So I hope you can see this, but economics is actually the second, comes second in this ranking right after medicine. And so you're going to have quite a good salary, as Iman also already alluded to, if you study economics. So that's just a very important point to keep in mind as well. And I think I'm not going to spend much time on this, but the fact that you're going to learn a different way of thinking and the systematic toolkit of evaluating questions is extremely valuable to a whole wide range of employers in the private sector, in government, in international organizations, and many, many more in the tech sector increasingly. And so there's a whole range of employment that you might consider going into that is as diverse as the questions that you can ask with economics toolkits. 
So assuming you decide to study economics, why would you study economics in Warwick? And Caroline talked about this also quite a bit already, so I'm, I'm going to keep it short and focus on the things that I especially value um, about Warwick. So the first thing is it is a challenging program, right? So that's a good thing. You're going to learn a lot and you're going to be surrounded by other students that also want to learn a lot. Um, I've only been here for a year, but I've already realized that this is true because in the classroom, typically students are interacting with each other and also with the faculty. So there's a lot of learning going on together. But we recognize, we understand, um, and this sets Warwick apart, I think, that there are also limits to what economics and economics methodology can buy you. So there are limits to the assumptions that we make, and there are a lot of other fields that, frankly, are studying the same questions, but using different methodologies and bringing a slightly different approach to it, and we can learn a lot from other, from other fields. That's why we offer, we put a strong emphasis on the interdisciplinary environment here, both through joint degree programs as well as um, a wide range of optional modules that you can take. And so you might be doing interdisciplinary work with um, fields coming, uh, going from ranging from uh, psychology if you're interested in behavioral economics, over political science if you're interested in, in PPE, um, the business school. We put emphasis on economic history and the history of economic thought, um, environmental science, and so on, just to name a few. We also are proud of the fact that the teaching that we do is research driven. So we're going to get you to the frontier um, in terms of knowledge that exists at the moment in economics research, so both theoretically as well as empirically. And then it's going to be driven by the research interests of the faculty um, at our department. And that honestly is one of the biggest reasons that I chose to be at this department compared to a different economics department. And that's because I value my colleagues because I can see that they're not just extremely smart researchers that are doing cutting edge research that, are, that really care about teaching, but actually they also take the time, which is rare for academics, to really try and make an impact on real policy decisions. And so I thought I'd just show three examples of what my colleagues that I'm very proud of and one day I hope to contribute similarly um, have done to change actual policy outcomes. So my, my colleague, Dr. Advani, for example, um, managed to change the committed resources for tax auditing uh, in the Labor Party's fair tax program. Um, my colleague, Professor Oswald, actually changed how uh, spending decisions in the UK are made based on um, taking into account the well-being that these different spendings uh, could lead to. And finally, my colleague, Dr. Imbert, actually managed to simplify the communication between tax authorities and taxpayers in Belgium. So I think these are really crucial and actual changes in policy that have been made, and this comes across in the classroom as well in how, how we teach. So um, myself, I'm a public and urban economist. So while you may have heard of public economics, you might ask, what is urban economics? So urban economics is a new field of economics that thinks about questions related to cities, as the name kind of suggests. So we think about how households, firms, and governments organize, organize across space. And then we think about issues which are specifically related to cities, such as affordable housing, pollution, public transit, crime, and so on. And questions that I particularly enjoy thinking about is the first one, for example, is trying to understand why people live where they do live. And this is extremely important, specifically when we think about government policies that then try to incentivize people to move to certain places. So one example I like to give that I also study is there's often a shortage of doctors in rural areas. And this leads to a big variation in health outcomes across space. But why is there this shortage? In order to be able to understand that and, and in order to mitigate the shortage of doctors in rural areas, we have to really understand what drives the, the location decisions of physicians. The second question, which I want to talk a little bit more about today, is actually how can we keep housing affordable? Now, economists have thought about this particular question for a long time. We have various sort of policy recommendations for how we can keep housing affordable, ranging from just building more social housing, so specifically targeted towards particular in income groups, um, giving assistance to first-time home buyers, um, giving, uh, giving households housing vouchers so they can actually freely pick where to live but pay the same amount. 
giving developers incentives to, if they're building an apartment complex, to set aside a few units for households below a certain income threshold while they can charge market rate or above market rate rents on the other units. And then in particular, what I think about, which is in a very basic Econ 101 world, you might think, well, if the price is really high, we can increase quantity and that should lower the price, right? So we should be able to add more housing supply to bring down housing prices. And so that's something that I look at because it's actually not as simple as we might think it is due to the existence of something called um, supply constraints. So regulations that particularly limit where new housing uh, can be put, for example. So before I launch into a little bit more of that, I just wanted to point out that if we're thinking about housing policy, we have to keep in mind that housing policy has played a deliberate role um, in increasing inequality in history. So where we live determines the opportunities that we can access to quite a large extent. It also determines our trajectories. So any policy that impacts where people can afford to live is going to matter a lot for these outcomes that, that families and individuals have. And so we always have to keep this in mind basically when we're studying housing policy. What I wanted to show here are just a few examples of how this has mattered in the past. So what you see on the right hand side is an image that's taken from the Washington Post and here every dot, this is the city of Chicago, every dot represents a person and every color represents a different race or ethnicity. Now what you can see is that Chicago is almost perfectly segregated um, by race and ethnicity, which also means it's quite segregated by income. And this is the result of policies, deliberate government housing policies that have been put in place in the past and have either been really persistent or have been replaced by different policies that do basically the same thing. A second example is on the top left-hand corner. And I talked just a little bit about developer incentives to keep a few units below the market rate. And this is a policy that means well, right? What it's saying is we're trying to uh, incentivize mixed income housing. We're trying to mix up in, um, neighborhoods and properties in terms of the incomes of people living in them. What actually ended up happening or ends up happening a lot is that you get, those are two doors of the same property. And basically what happened is developers put a different door for the cheaper units than they did for the expensive units. And so ultimately, it's a policy that tries um, to do something good, but it has these unintended consequences that are not necessarily um, doing the same thing as the policy was intended to. So when we're studying policy, this is something I try to emphasize a lot. We have to think about spillover effects as well as unintended consequences of these policies too. So something that's maybe closer to a decision that you might face uh, if you decide to come to Warwick is uh, where are you going to live in this area? Um, and so there are actually quite a few options, uh, maybe more uh, than you might think. So if what might drive you to pick a different place. So if you like big city amenities, but you don't want to be too far away from campus, you might choose to live in Coventry, which is in the top left corner. If you want to be closer to other students and not as close to campus, but still very easily accessible, then maybe you live in Leamington Spa, which is the top middle. If you think you want to live where many professors live, then maybe you choose to live in Kenilworth, which is on the right here. Um, if you like sort of medieval uh, towns and maybe you have a car so you don't rely on the bus, then you can live in Warwick, which is the bottom left-hand corner. And if, um, like me, you really think, <laughs> I don't live in London, but I come from a capital city, and if anything, the only thing that will do for you is a capital city and the amenities related to the capital city, well, then maybe you choose to live in London and actually commute. But um, in all of these decisions, what's really important is how expensive is it to live where? And of course, this might not be news to you, but we are in the middle, even before the cost of living crisis, we were already in the middle of a housing affordability um, crisis. So on the left-hand side, you see a graph that just shows you the growth rates of housing costs relative to incomes. And this graph is going up over time, which tells you that housing costs have risen way more than incomes have. So over time, housing has become increasingly unaffordable. What you see is that Britain actually has some of the highest increases in house prices relative to other high-income countries. So that's uh, on the, at the bottom in the middle. And then I'm not entirely sure if this is clear, but if you look at the third image on the right-hand side here, that's actually an image of new housing supply. And you can see that that image, this is an image over time, um, the graph is way down. So 
new housing supply is way down from the 16s and 70s today. So why is that happening? Why are prices so high at the same time supply is extremely low, new supply is extremely low? Well, one reason for that is the role that um, housing supply restrictions play. So um, most of the work that I do actually relates to the United States, but I wanted to give you an example of what a housing supply restriction is uh, that's maybe closer to home. So in England, one example of housing supply restrictions are the so-called green belts that are around uh, most of the big cities uh, in this country. So for example, the London green belt is huge and it can go up to 40 to 50 miles deep around London. What are green belts? Well, these are just vast expanses of land where no new construction is basically allowed. So there's no, these are no growth zones. But as you can see closer to where we are right now, there's also a green belt around Birmingham um, and, and Coventry. So why do these matter? Well, even within cities, you already have restrictions on what can be built where, right? So in London, for example, you have to preserve certain views, like the view of St. Paul's Cathedral. So you can't build any kind of height anywhere. So you've already restricted housing within cities. Now you also don't allow, allow cities to spread out and then you've restricted them even further. Of course, this has not been um, ignored. So policymakers have had the idea to build new housing on Greenbelt land. For example, in the green belt that surrounds Birmingham. Um, however, then enters the second issue, which makes it really difficult to add new housing supply, which is that this, this is often met with quite a lot of local opposition. So the people that choose to live next to green belts strongly oppose building new homes there because they specifically chose to live there in order to enjoy the green space and the amenities of the green belt. Also, existing homeowners rarely want their house prices to go down. So this is an example of a supply restriction in England, and this already shows us how complicated it can be to add uh, new housing. What I study is usually the US context, and in the US, housing supply restrictions are often given by so-called density restrictions or minimum lot sizes. So what is a density restriction? In the US, basically, there's a determination how many dwelling units can be built on any acre of land. And this translates into what is called the minimum lot size, which is basically the smallest piece of land that you have to purchase to live in a given neighborhood. Now, this doesn't sound too bad until you realize that sometimes that smallest piece of land you have to buy is the size of a football field. And so we can instantly see how forcing people to buy a size of land the size of a football field could lead to spatial inequality by systematically changing who can live where. And often the outcome of such regulations ends up being what you kind of see on the left, um, is cities where you can very clearly see the demarcation between different density regulations, right? So kind of in the middle of the picture, you have these taller buildings with smaller units, and maybe small apartment buildings, and what's behind it is actually quite different, and it's something like townhouses, so those you can think of as bigger and maybe standalone um, units. And um, the interesting thing is these are right across the street from each other, right? The only difference here is that the regulation changed. Otherwise, across the street from each other, these people are neighbors. You might be sending your kids to the same school. You're going to the same parks. You're going to the same, you're going shopping to the same stores and so on. So the only difference is that on one side of this division, houses are smaller and probably cheaper as we're going to test and on the other side, they're larger. So keep this kind of division in mind. And sorry, I should say, why does this matter? <laughs> so this matters because um, strict regulations, so larger lots, lower density, are often correlated both with higher rents, so being more expensive, and secondly, more regulated areas tend to have the public amenities that people really like, such as high-performing um, public schools. Keeping that image of the line in mind, that's exactly how we're going to test. So how can we test the impact of different types of regulations on who lives where and the cost of housing, well, we can think of exactly that line that you saw drawn across the city. And you can think of that as being the difference or this boundary between neighborhood one and neighborhood two. And in that case, what we, do, we can do is we can compare prices as well as the characteristics of people living on either side of these boundaries of neighborhood one um, and neighborhood two where again, the basic idea is that the only difference on either side is the regulation. Otherwise, these people are living in exactly the same neighborhood, essentially. And so that's what I do, and what do I find? So think of that zero in the middle as being that boundary again. 
everything that's to the right of zero is going to be the more regulated side of a boundary. So in our image, it's going to be the, the northern part, so the place that has smaller, has, has fewer lots, sorry, larger but fewer lots, so lower density, and everything that's to the left of zero is going to be the less regulated side, so the place with the smaller lots and higher density. What I find is that right at the boundary, the actual lot size jumps by about 45%. So lots are 45% larger across the road where the regulation is stricter than on the other side. What this means is that given the chance, people would be building on smaller lots just like the neighbors on the other side of the road would. So these regulations have a real impact on the composition of homes. And then the left image remains the same here, but on the right, I'm actually looking at the price of housing. And as you can see, there's about, well, you can't see, but I'm telling you, there's a 19% jump in the, in the sales price on the more regulated side of the boundary compared to the less regulated side of a boundary. So not only are those homes larger in the more regulated areas, they're also um, more expensive. And then it's not at all su surprising that people living in those areas are also 16% richer. So basically this regulation supply that's essentially a supply restriction, so it's limiting how many dwelling units can be built on an acre of land, is leading to tremendous segregation on income in terms of who is living where. That's one side of the story. Now the second question is, well, if we relax these regulations, does housing supply increase and do prices actually fall? So to do that, um, what we look at, so in, this is from, from another piece of research, is the greater Boston area. And so Boston, let me see, Boston is this city. Um, and what we're looking at is if you allow one more dwelling unit on an acre of land, what happens to housing supply in this case? Now the darker red the color is, the more housing supply is actually being added by allowing this additional dwelling unit. So as you can see on the right hand side, the most housing supply gets added actually in and around, immediately in and around Boston. But also some supply gets added in the suburbs. If you look at the prices, this picture kind of flips. So the darker the blue is now, the more there is a fall in housing prices and rents. And as you can see, right in Boston, the house prices actually stay quite similar. And that's because you can imagine you're adding however many units you want in London, people are just going to move in. It's not going to actually relax prices very much, it's just those units are instantly going to be bought up by all the people wanting to live in London. On the other hand, further out in the suburbs, we have actually prices falling quite a bit. Which brings us back to the green belt, because of course, who lives in the suburbs? Well, it's A, homeowners who don't want the prices of their homes to fall, and it's B, people who selected to live there because they like to live in a low density area. The last thing I'll talk about is just a policy that's quite popular at the moment, which is increasing density near transit stops, because obviously transit stops are great places to have housing because people can then live close to public transit and commute to work. Ignore the yellow dots, but all the dots are different transit stations. And again, the darker blue the color is, the further rents and prices are going to fall at these different stops. And as you can see, the further away you go from Boston again, the further prices fall. So same story, the places that prices are going to fall the most in, if we relax regulations, are also the places that are very likely going to give the highest resistance and the highest local opposition to exactly that policy. And so as economists, this is as far as we can go, we can say here are the trade-offs, here's how different kind of groups are going to benefit or not benefit from a given policy, and then we can take this to policymakers and ask, well, then it's going to be up to them to decide how they're going to balance these different motives and these different groups um, in the population. So that's all I have um, for today. I hope this was a little bit illuminating for you. I hope you learned something new. I just wanted to reiterate, I love this department quite a lot. I love my colleagues. I hope you consider studying economics, studying it here. Happy to chat more. And there are, I think, ambassadors also by the doors, the people in the blue t-shirts, um, to answer more of your questions as well. So thank you very much.